Hello everyone and welcome! In today's video, I'm going to be showcasing our latest RC chassis kit, which is the FFR SC1 Builder Series kit that you see here. I'll be sharing some information about this new kit, as well as going over the complete assembly process in detail. This chassis kit is designed for lightweight 124th and 125th scale bodies, such as the ones found in plastic model car kits. This is a front motor, rear wheel drive layout with a solid axle in the rear. In fact, this FFR SC1 chassis is pretty much identical to the kits that we've offered for a while now, but this kit has been sort of reworked to make it more complete and easier to assemble. This kit really is the product of customer feedback and requests. A lot of builders wanted a more complete package and a kit more similar to other major manufacturers, so we hope this kit proves to satisfy those requests. As many of you probably already know, our primary focus, especially over the past few years, has really been on providing digital STL print files for all you to 3D print at home. We've got various chassis, suspension parts, wheels, and all kinds of accessories and other items over on our Patreon page, with more things being added every month. It's all thanks to the great support from our very generous patrons, but of course for those without 3D printers or for those who want to skip the step of printing all the parts themselves, well we do have several kits and chassis available for purchase over on our website. Our FDM 3D printable FFR SC1 chassis has been a popular choice, as it sort of fits in between the brutally simplistic FPUC1 and the brutally non-simplistic custom-built chassis like the ones I've showcased on this channel. It strikes a nice balance of realism and simplicity, as well as being relatively durable and versatile as the Dukes of Hazard Recreation series has taught us. We've worked this already established platform into this new kit. Now I do feel it's worth mentioning that this kit is by no means intended for beginners or inexperienced hobbyists. It's not the hardest RC kit in the world to put together, but it's certainly not the easiest. If you'd like to get an idea of what you can expect, I recommend you watch through this video and get an idea if this project is suited to your interests and skill level. Now it's also important to note that each one of these kits is going to be sized to fit either a specific model kit, a series of similar model kits, or a specific RC body with the wheelbase and width varying depending on what size body it needs to fit. Unlike with most RC bodies, which tend to be more standardized in size, wheelbase, and width, even if that means making a Toyota FJ40 and a Chevy K5 Blazer roughly the same size, model kits are generally a more true-to-scale depiction of the car that they are replicating. As an example, note the difference in size here between the 69 Camaro and 70 Chevelle. They're both 125th scale, but the Chevelle is noticeably larger than the Camaro. The Chevelle is longer, wider, and has a longer wheelbase. Why? Well, in the real world, a 70 Chevelle is a bigger car than a 69 Camaro, and that difference in size is displayed correctly among these two models. Now, this is cool because you can park these two cars next to each other and they look correct, unlike with some RC bodies. A small detail, but still cool. The catch, though, is when you think about all the different model kits that you might want to use with this chassis, everything from maybe an early live axle RX-7 or C1 Corvette, all the way to a full-size street truck, that's some serious size difference between those bodies, and one FFR SC1 chassis size is not going to be able to fit everything. Hence why we're going through specific model kits and sizing the chassis to fit them perfectly. The majority of the parts in all of these kits are the same from one to another, but having a few different size parts means we can make this chassis fit many popular model kits. Beyond that though, this also gives us the opportunity to offer you some good looking wheel options likely some OEM style wheels and some aftermarket style designs as well. This specific kit I have here is sized to fit various 125th scale AMT third generation Camaro and Firebird model kits. The third generation of the Camaro and Firebird spans from model years 1982 to 1992. More information about compatible kits can be found on our website. Now, if you're wondering why of all the cars and model kits we could have chosen from to have this first batch of kits sized to fit, we picked these older AMT Camaro and Firebird kits. Well, we already offered this size chassis for sale on our site, so it made sense to simply transition those parts from the old kit into this new kit, and being a little on the obscure side, we figured demand might be a little lower, letting us ease into the introduction of these new kits and giving us more time to correct issues, collect feedback, stock parts, and get things organized in our shop. We will soon have variations of this FFR SC1 chassis kit sized for various other more popular and current model kits, so be sure to stay tuned.
Let's talk about this kit more generally now. For one, this is a quote-unquote pre-production kit I'm building here, so a few things will be different from the one that you'll receive, but overall it's the same. Note that the 101mm wheelbase on my kit here is a typo. The chassis will actually have a wheelbase of 102mm, which will fit those AMT 125th scale Camaro and Firebird kits perfectly. A small detail, but if you're wondering why your kit says 102mm, unlike mine, that's why. Now here's a key difference between this kit and our prior ones. Before we sold the electronics, hardware, and chassis pieces separately. We did this so that those who want to 3D print their own chassis parts can do so, then buy the remaining items that they need without being forced to purchase parts that they can print at home. Now that option is still available for those who want to 3D print their own chassis parts, but customers who won't be printing their own parts have requested a complete kit that has everything, so that's what's included here. The only additional parts you'll need to make the car drive are the items that we don't sell, which include the body, the transmitter and receiver, and battery. Everything else is here. Another thing we've changed is how we've organized everything. It's a little bit more like a conventional RC chassis kit that many of you may be already familiar with. Some components are also already pre-glued or pre-assembled. This means less work for you and less loose parts and hardware to deal with. Your kit may differ slightly, but the assembly process will be the same. As you can see here, this bag contains the chassis that everything will be secured to. You can remove it from the bag and set it aside for now. The bags with the parts needed to assemble the chassis are numbered. Don't open the bags and mix everything together, also wait until you've completed the prior number bag before going on to the next one unless stated otherwise. That might seem obvious, but I thought it was still worth mentioning. You can have a guess now at which bag we'll be needing first. That's right, bag 1. This bag contains all of the parts for the MA-10 rear axle assembly. On the far left, you'll notice that we have two extra axle housing pieces. These are small parts with a lot of detail, so although we do our best to spot any defective parts, for extra assurance that you're getting a great part, we include a spare set just in case. You can look them over for any issues and choose the two that you want to use. If we did our job well, it shouldn't matter which two you choose, though of course one needs to be the front side and one the rear side, just like the two that I have here. So we have two bags of gears and three pinion gear options to choose from. Regular builders may be familiar with these options, but for those who aren't, here's the rundown. The first option on the left uses a small screw to secure the drive shaft socket to the pinion gear. This allows the drive shaft socket to be removable, but the screw can be tricky to install, and the hole in the pinion shaft limits its durability. The two pinion gears on the right don't have any screw holes, making them stronger. In fact, one has a hole through the center, so a steel reinforcement can be placed inside. On these, the socket can simply be glued on. These are the easier, higher strength option, but if you ever need to take them apart, you're going to need to cut them and use a brand new pinion gear and socket to replace them. Brass gears with a screw hole are also available for purchase, but are not included with this kit. Really though, these gears should be fine for any typical use. The choice on what to use is simply up to you. I decided to go with the steel reinforced pinion gear for maximum strength and ease of installation. I slid the small steel rod through the center of the pinion gear, carefully using a little glue to secure it in place. After that, get two bearings out of the bag and install them in the front half of the MA-10 axle housing as shown, making sure they are fully seated. The pinion gear can now simply be slid right through the center as shown. Make sure that once again it is fully seated before securing the drive shaft socket, either with a little glue or the screw depending on which pinion gear you chose. The pinion gear should be able to spin with little to no resistance. The less play there is, the better, but a certain amount is to be expected. Here's a look at what you should have so far. Now 
Next, we'll secure the ring gear to the threaded axle shaft. Now, I believe the rear axle shafts in this kit will be pre-cut to a little over 70 millimeters in length. If you are in a situation where you need to cut the axle shaft shorter, you'll want to do that now before you glue the ring gear to it. How long the rear axle shaft needs to be will vary from one body to another, but a good rule of thumb is to make the axle shaft the same width as the body. If you wanted to, you could get the wheels out and do a quick mock-up to really dial it in, but I'm good with the length that the rear axle is for this build, so I'll go ahead and glue the ring gear to the center of this axle shaft. If it's one or two millimeters off of center, it's not a big deal, but it's best to be as accurate as you can. Make sure you use a strong adhesive and give it plenty of time to dry. Super glue might not be the strongest option, but it does work as long as the car isn't too heavy and you're not going to be traveling at super high speeds, which this chassis isn't really designed to do anyways. Next, you'll want to get out two more bearings and two hex wheel mounts. Slide one bearing on each side of the axle, then thread on a hex mount on each side as well. Lay it on the front half of the axle housing as shown. This is the final result that you want. You'll want to adjust the wheel mounts so that the ring gear and pinion gear are lined up and the axle can spin with minimal resistance. It's very important to pay attention to this cutout here on the axle housing and make sure that the ring gear is installed on the correct side. If not, it won't turn. A little side-to-side -side play is normal, but it is best to keep it to a minimum. The most important thing is to make sure that the gears are aligned correctly and the axle can spin with minimal resistance. Use a bit of glue to secure each wheel mount in place. This is what you should have so far. Get the grease from bag number 5 and put some on the gears. Keep that grease on hand as we'll be using it throughout the build. Next, we'll secure each half of the axle housing together with the small black screws. Eight will be used in total. Four shorter screws on the outer portions of the axle housing and four longer screws towards the center. It's important to note the orientation that you see here. These upper spring seats right here and the upper link mount should all be facing the same direction just as shown. Here's how it should look. Again, make sure the axle can rotate with minimal resistance. Bag 1 is complete. I'll put everything from it away and get out bag 2. Bag 2 contains all of the rear suspension links and parts that will secure the rear axle to the chassis. We can start by securing the panhard bar to the axle using the M1.6 hardware included in this bag, which is the only bag to contain only hardware. Make sure your panhard bar is oriented just like mine is here and also be sure not to over tighten the screw so the panhard bar can move easily. Next, we can secure the lower trailing arms to the axle using two of the longer machine screws and two nuts. To make sure the lower trailing arms can move around smoothly, I like to use a hobby knife to remove any imperfections and open up the holes just a bit. The easier these links can move around, the better the suspension will work. We can then insert the screws as shown and then make sure that they stay in place with the nuts. Be sure to use some Loctite to make sure the nuts don't come loose. Finally, we can install the upper link. The thinner side of the upper link is the side that gets secured to the axle. Once again, be sure not to over-tighten. It should be able to move up and down. 
Here's how your axle assembly should look with these parts installed. Now let's install this axle assembly on the chassis. We can start by using two of the shorter screws that were included in the bag with the lower control arms to secure them to the chassis. I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but again, be sure not to over tighten these tiny screws. This chassis isn't a basher and they don't need that much force to stay secure. Next use another of the shorter 5mm length screws that you used to secure the panhard bar earlier to the axle to secure the other end of the panhard bar to the chassis. Finally, use one of the smallest size screws to secure the upper link to the chassis. Here's how the rear end should look so far. The rear axle assembly should be able to move smoothly. This is an on-road car, not a crawler, so don't expect much flex, but it should be able to move around a bit as you see here. As you could probably guess, the rear springs go in between the axle and the chassis. A thicker 0.3mm and thinner 0.2mm spring is provided. I'm going to set the springs aside for now, as I don't want to have to worry about them flying out as I'm building the chassis. I'll come back and install them later on. I'll pack up everything from that last bag and move on to the next one, which of course is bag number three. Bag three contains the drivetrain and motor. These parts are what's going to make the rear axle spin. The motor will sit up front under the hood and the power will be transferred through a center drive shaft. First thing you'll need to do is solder the JST connector onto the motor. You will see a little plus symbol on one of the terminals on the motor, which is where you'll want to solder the red wire to. Next, what we're going to want to do is sort of mock everything up because we need to cut a section of this 2mm steel rod to the correct length. You can use the screws to secure the motor mount to the chassis. Make sure that you use the center holes that you see here. Then you can slide the motor socket onto the output shaft, as well as place on the drive shaft ends and get an idea of how long you need the drive shaft to be. As you can see, I marked a section right here, cut it to that length, test fit it, and refine the length until it fits in between the motor and the rear axle assembly. It needs to be long enough so it doesn't fall out, but you can't make it too long as the rear suspension will bind up and not want to move easily. Hopefully that all makes sense. This process is almost easier to do than it is to explain. There just needs to be a little play with the drive shaft, moving it from front to back, but of course not too much to where the drive shaft can fall out. Be sure to take your time and mock things up before gluing. It's easier to remove the material than it is to add it back. Once you get the steel rod to the correct length, you can glue the drive shaft ends on and put it in between the motor and the axle. Now here I recommend using a slower drying glue. That way if you find the drive shaft is a little too short, all you have to do is pull one of the drive shaft ends away from the end of the steel rod and let the glue dry. You should end up with your chassis looking like what I have here and with the rear suspension able to move up and down smoothly and the drive shaft not being at any risk of falling out. In the future, we might experiment with having all metal rods pre-cut to the correct length, even if it means charging a bit more per kit. The length of this rod is one of the few things that will vary from one FFR SC1 kit to another, depending on what model kit the chassis is sized to fit, so there isn't really a one-size-fits-all solution here, but hopefully you builders out there will share some feedback with us and let us know if a slightly pricier kit with pre-cut rods would be your preference or if you don't really mind doing the cutting yourself. 
We'll let your ideas and feedback help us with future kits. Bag 4 contains the parts we'll use to build the modular FF01 front suspension and steering assembly. As you may notice, unlike with prior kits, quite a bit has already been pre-glued and pre-assembled, which will cut down on the time it takes to build this assembly and you won't have as many tiny parts to keep track of. We'll start by assembling the steering knuckles using the parts that you see here. Place two bearings in the openings on the front and back side of each knuckle, then slide the axle shafts through the center and thread on the hex wheel mount. Make sure the orientation of your knuckle is the same as mine. The axle shafts as they are now will work, but they are far longer than they need to be. To give the finished car a better overall appearance, I'm going to be cutting them shorter. This is technically optional, but it will give a better look in the end. I'll go ahead and open up the bag containing the wheels. The wheel nuts, and in this case some wheel hex mounts to use as spacers, are also included in this bag. I threaded on the hex mount, which will act as a spacer, then slid on the wheel and installed the nut to see how much excess material I need to remove. I marked where I wanted to make the cut with a black marker, then cut each axle to that length. Once the axle shafts were the length that I wanted, I reinstalled the hex wheel mounts with some glue to hold them in place. Be sure not to over tighten the wheel mounts as doing so won't allow the axle to spin freely, though also make sure that the mount isn't too loose which will cause excessive play. Your steering knuckles should look just like these knuckles here. Next we'll glue this small metal tube into this hole on the very front of the chassis. This is what the steering center link will slide through. This tube is far longer than what it needs to be, so for this specific chassis I'll cut it shorter, so it's just a little bit longer than the plastic section on the front of the chassis. When gluing it in, make sure you don't get any glue on the inside of the tube, this might cause the center link to not be able to move smoothly through it. Yours should look similar to what I have here. Locate this upper piece that you see here, then get the four remaining bearings. This is technically optional, but I highly recommend securing each one of these bearings into these recessed areas using a little glue to hold them in place. That way you don't have to worry about them coming out during assembly, also, sometimes they'll want to move up and down with the suspension, so this just helps lock them in place. Just be sure not to use too much glue or get sloppy with it, as of course you don't want to glue the bearings so the inner portion will no longer rotate. Here's how it should look. So here's an important step to make your front suspension function optimally. The upper and lower posts on the steering knuckles need to be able to slide through the center of the bearings nice and smooth with minimal resistance. You need them to be able to slide up and down easily for the best functioning suspension. Due to the orientation that they are 3D printed in, you'll likely need to remove a bit of material from this back edge. 
You can scrape this edge away with a knife, as well as smooth it out with some sandpaper. Much like removing flashing or mold lines on a model kit will allow for better fitment and a better final appearance, removing similar imperfections from these parts will help them move smoothly and function optimally. Each post should be able to slide through the center of the bearing as shown. A little grease can be applied to the posts prior to installing the knuckles on the chassis. While we have the steering knuckles out, go ahead and grab this parts bag that you see here that contains several parts for the steering linkage. We can go ahead and grab the tie rod pieces and sandwich them in between these O-rings on the knuckles as shown. Be sure you orient your tie rods just as I have here, with both threaded rods facing the same direction. Don't over tighten these nuts, as the steering linkage needs to be able to move around some. Also be sure to use some Loctite to keep those nuts from coming loose. We'll do the same thing to secure these center link ends. Remove the nut and one o-ring on the tie rods, then slide the center link end on and reinstall the o-ring and nut with some Loctite. It's especially important not to over tighten these nuts as the center link ends need to be able to move around a bit and over tightening can damage these tiny parts. Here's what you should have so far. Next you'll need to cut a section of spring that will go on the top of each steering knuckle. You can choose between the thinner 0.2mm and thicker 0.3mm springs. Which spring you choose and how long you make your springs really comes down to personal preference and how much your car weighs. It may be something that you experiment with a bit. You really don't need your springs to be very long to be effective, usually about as long or a bit shorter than the upper post on the knuckle. I slid the springs on as shown, greased the posts on the knuckles, and put each knuckle in place on the chassis. Then I can secure the upper support piece on top and use the M1.6 screws to secure it to the chassis. Here's what you should have so far. Be sure that the knuckles can both move up and down and steer left and right without issues. Next, get the bag with the steering arm that you see here. Press fit it on the right steering knuckle as shown, making sure it is fully seated. If later you notice that there is excessive play between the knuckle and the steering arm, you can use an adhesive to eliminate that play. Of course that will make removing the arm without damaging it more difficult, so only do this after you've finished the chassis and are satisfied with the front suspension. Next let's cut a section of this 1.5mm metal rod that will serve as the center link. The distance will vary depending on the width of your chassis. Just like with the drive shaft earlier, be sure you test fit everything before gluing the rod to the center link ends. If you want the front wheels to tow out, you'll want a slightly longer center link or a slightly shorter center link to have the front wheels tow in. Once you've test fit the rod and you're satisfied with the tow angle, you can glue each center link end to the rod. Make sure that the center link can move smoothly from side to side. You can use some grease on the center link to help it slide easier. We can connect the steering arm to the steering servo by cutting another section of 1.5mm rod to around 25mm in length, then glue it to each end. Here's how it should look. I didn't show it here, but it's a good idea to remove this M1 nut from the steering arm and reinstall it with some Loctite, just as was done on the steering linkage before. 
You certainly don't want that nut coming loose and getting lost. Be sure not to over tighten that nut, as just like with the steering linkage, this end needs to have some room to move. Next, we can move on to bag five, which will contain the magnetic body mounts, tailpipes, a spare over axle piece, and the rear piece with hardware. We can go ahead and install the rear piece using the included hardware as shown. At this point, since the chassis is nearly complete, I went ahead and installed the rear springs. Just like with the front springs, which thickness you choose and how long you make your springs will come down to personal preference and how heavy your car is. You may find yourself modifying the rear springs as you progress with your build and get the weight of the body and electronics added. The springs will hold themselves in place, though a small amount of glue once you know what size springs you want to use is a good idea to help keep them in place. Finally, we can install the wheels. Your wheels may look different depending on which option you chose, but with some wheels like these OEM style ones, they include a extra set of hex wheel mounts. These will be needed to space out the wheels so they fit the chassis. The hex wheel mounts can be threaded on the axles, then the wheels can be placed on and secured with a nut. You can use a mild adhesive such as water washable glue to help keep the wheel nuts from coming loose. And with the wheels on, the chassis is now fully assembled. It's ready for the electronics and body to be added. I'll be covering that process in an upcoming video. I hope all you builders found this video helpful. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. We look forward to releasing more variations of this kit in the future, sized for different model kits, so be sure to stay tuned for updates on that. If you'd like to order the kit that I've showcased in this video, the link is below in the description. At the time of releasing this video, we've only got a small stock of the kits available, but we will create more kits in larger batches as we continue to collect feedback and refine these kits more and more over time. Also, in case you weren't already aware, the STL files for this chassis are available over on Patreon. I'll be sure to include the link to that below in the description as well. As always, thanks everyone for watching, good luck with your builds, and be sure to stay tuned for more content related to these chassis kits, as well as much more stuff on the way soon. Until then, I'll see you next time.